Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh everyone. Uh, here I am in a hotel room in Boston, alhamdulillah. Uh, just got in, so I know I'm a few minutes late. <clears throat> uh, this time I'm not gasping for air though, alhamdulillah, so I'm fully refreshed. Um, but I am a little worried about the uh, the hotel Wi-Fi. And uh, yes, I have T-Mobile and it's not the best of service. So inshallah, make dua for the service. Uh, for it to stay connected. Hopefully we won't have any uh, issues with, with cutting off on the live stream or anything of that sort. <clears throat> so we actually come to <clears throat> one of my favorite portions, subhanAllah, of the Qur'an. This is Juz 7. And Juz 7 um, is the end of Surah Al-Ma'idah and the beginning of Surah Al-An'am. So it starts at Surah Al-Ma'idah from verse 82 and it goes to Surah Al-An'am verse 110. Now, um, Surah Al-Ma'idah is still within the Madani breath, so it still has the same concepts, the same um, ideas are being revealed in Surah Al-Ma'idah, where you have a um, you have uh, the concept of law constantly being alluded to. Uh, in fact, the laws get more mature as Surah Al-Ma'idah goes on, so it goes on from the, from the laws of the the meat slaughter to more laws and so on and so forth. Um, in regards to oats, in regards to intoxicants and gambling and sorcery and and uh, you know all of these different sophisticated laws that come in Medina, so it sort of continues along that same breath uh, that we've already been seeing in Surah Al Maidah, and then of course it ends with with the story of Isa salam, the story of of Jesus peace be upon him and the table spread, which we'll talk about, and then Surah Al An'am is actually a Makki surah, so it's going to be the introduction of Makki Quran. Uh, as we're going along with the Qur'an. It's the first time a Mecca surah shows up um, in the Qur'an, and it's a glorious, glorious, glorious surah. And of course, all of the Qur'an is glorious, but you'll see why um, Al-An'am is so uh, powerful um, in this regard. <clears throat> so Surah Al-Ma'idah, if we get into it from verse 82 onwards, uh, we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises some of the Christians that recognize the truth as they hear it. وَإِذَا سَمِعُوا مَا أُنزِلَ إِلَى رَسُولِ تَرَى أَعْيُنُهُمْ تَفِيضُ مِنَ الدَّمْعِ مِمَّا عَرَفُوا مِنَ الْحَقِّ يَقُولُونَ رَبَّنَا آمَنَّا فَاكْتُبْنَا مَعَ الشَّاهِدِينَ That there is a group of Christians that when they hear about the Prophet ﷺ, when they hear about Islam, they recognize that this is indeed the awaited messenger, that this is the continuation. So right away they say, oh Allah, you know, their eyes swell up with tears and they say, oh our Lord, we believe, so write us down. Um, from amongst uh, those who bear witness, meaning write us down from amongst the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and this is uh, at the occasion of, according to some of the Mufassirin, uh, some of the the priests that were sent by Najashi and Abyssinia to meet the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. That there was a group of priests, and <clears throat> when the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam recited the Quran to them, they all started to cry and they recognized the truth, the same way that Najashi also cried and recognized the truth. When he heard the message. So this was a group of Christians that were waiting for the Prophet ﷺ. When they heard about the Prophet ﷺ, they immediately accepted it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the thawab, the reward for these people that recognized the Prophet ﷺ and that accepted the Prophet ﷺ and that believed in the previous prophets and saw this as a continuation. And in fact, there's something very beautiful. The Prophet ﷺ said that a person who believed in Isa alayhi salam and then believed in the Prophet Sallallahu then he would have two rewards. He would actually have double the ajr for believing in Jesus, peace be upon him, and then believing in the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So there is a special reward for the one who acknowledged Isa Islam, acknowledged Jesus, peace be upon him, and then moves on to acknowledge the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as well. So then we move on to the new laws. So in verse 89, for example, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala mentions the breaking of the oaths. Um, and he mentions the kafara, he mentions the expiation. And I know that a lot of us are accustomed to, if we say wallahi, uh, and it's wrong that we fast for three days. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually mentions it'am wa ashrati masakin to feed 10 poor people or to clothe 10 poor people. And if you're incapable of feeding 10 poor people or clothing 10 poor people, uh, then you fast for three days. So usually when it comes to expiation, you start off with fasting and you go to charity. But when it comes to the oats, you start off with charity and then you move to fasting as a uh, as a last uh, resort. Um, so we, we go in now to verse 90 to 93. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya min amal shaytani Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O you who believe, verily intoxicants and gambling 
and uh, sacrificing upon, you know, uh, sacrificing in a way that's inappropriate, uh, you know, basically to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and uh, allotting arrows, um, you know, in, in a way that you're, you're casting arrows and you're trusting the shayateen, all of these are from the deviations of the shaytan, so avoid them so that you may be successful. So the first mentions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala telling everyone to, to avoid all of these things. Now obviously when these things were legislated in Medina, a lot of the Muslims felt a sense of stress. Why? Because they were accustomed to drinking, they were accustomed to gambling, they were accustomed to uh, al-ansab, al-azlam, you know, the sacrifices, and, and especially the arrows and things of that sort. So this was very stressful to them. So when it came down, a lot of them started to puke out the khamr that they drank, uh, and they started to try to get anything out of their system that they felt like was inappropriate. So subhanAllah, it's it's very beautiful that in verse 93, immediately after the prohibition, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَيْسَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ جُنَاحٌ فِيمَا طَعِمُوا إِذَا مَتَّقَوا وَآمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ That there is no blame on those who believe and do righteousness for what they've consumed in the past. They don't have to worry about the haram that they've consumed in the past, whether that was in the form of inappropriate food, or whether it was in the form of alcohol consumption, which was the real concern for the people, uh, the followers of the Prophet ﷺ, because they, drinking was a part of the culture uh, at the time. So for, for the prohibition of khamr to come, uh, they were very scared. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts them to ease right away in verse 93, uh, and tells them that they won't be charged so long as they've actually made that change in their lives. Uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to hold them accountable for that which they've done in the past. Uh, verse 94 to the to verse 100, you see the laws of hunting in Ihram and Hajj and Umrah. So particularly uh, more laws are being developed now as, as a, you know in regards to how to uphold the sanctity of the Kaaba, the sanctity of the Ihram, and when hunting is prohibited. Um, <clears throat> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also in the middle, this is 94 to 100, in the middle of these verses, He says, أُحِلَّ لَكُمْ صَيْدُ الْبَحْرِ So Allah makes permissible, uh, you know, uh, the game of the sea. So, so, so uh, you know, fishing and so on and so forth, eating that which comes from the sea. And the Prophet ﷺ of course said that its water is pure and its animals are pure as well. So sea life is pure for you as well. So Allah makes the, some prohibitions as well as uh, expressing the permission for the believers to eat from uh, the sea. The reason why this is important is because uh, many of the Muslims saw this connection to the people of the book. So they assumed that the laws of halal were really following exactly in the laws of kosher. So there was a fear that eating from the sea would actually be prohibited as it is in some ways in the in, in kosher law. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it clear that that uh, a gift to this ummah is that all that is that comes from the sea um, is halal. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhaladheena amanu. This is now verse 101 to 104. Ya ayyuhaladheena amanu, la tas'alu an ashya in tubda lakum tasu'kum. O you who believe, don't persist in questioning the way that the people of Musa alayhi salam did, the way that Bani Israel did. And if, you know, because if, if you keep on asking, things are going to be shown to you and they will distress you. What that means is that, you know, if you keep on asking and persist in asking, the Prophet ﷺ said, you make things haram for you. And if you remember in Surah An-Nisa, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the food was, all of the food was halal for Bani Israel, except for that which they made haram on themselves. So there was, an, there was added strictness when it wasn't uh, necessary that made things difficult upon them. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, it's okay. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made things halal for you, then stick to it. Don't persist in questioning in a way that you're going to make things uh, difficult. Uh, SubhanAllah, I just looked at the comments. Please don't ask for wives <laughs> while, you're, while you're chatting on, <laughs> on this thing. So please take your marriage pursuits elsewhere. That's part of the haram questioning right now too. So um, yeah, so anyway, things are halal for you um, unless they've been made haram. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, don't go into details the way that the people of Musa Islam did and make things haram for you that aren't haram for you in the first place. Then you have uh, the laws of the will and the final testament. So verse 105 to 108, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clarifies uh, some of the questions about the will and the final testament. And finally, from, from 109 until the end of the surah, you have the story of Isa alayhi salam, the story of Jesus, peace be upon him. 
And it starts off with um, إذ قال الحواريون When the disciples said يا عيسى ابن مريم هل يستطيع ربك أن ينزل علينا مائدة من السماء Is it possible that you can ask your Lord to send down to us a table spread with food from the heaven? Now what this refers to is that Isa Islam, towards the end of his life, he fasted with his followers uh, for a period of 30 days. So they asked at the end of that fast if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could send them some special food for them. So they asked Isa Islam, is it possible that your Lord can send us some food from the heaven? Isa alayhi salam says, اِتَّقُوا اللَّهَ إِن كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ Fear Allah if you are believers. Here's the thing, Isa alayhi salam, he understood the question uh, as being one of doubt. But they clarified to Isa alayhi salam saying that, no, it's not one of doubt, you know, we just want to eat from it. Well, and, and, and it will also put our hearts to eat, ease. وَنَعْلَمُ أَنْ قَدْ صَدَقْتَنَا And we'll be even more affirmed, reaffirmed in our faith that you've indeed told the truth to us. So we're not asking you for doubt, we're just asking for a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Isa understood that, so he made dua to Allah, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent upon them a beautiful table spread with all types of food and so on and so forth. Now the gem of this in particular is compare the disciples of Christ, the disciples of Jesus, peace be upon him, to the followers of Musa alayhi salam, when the food came down from the heavens for them. They were completely ungrateful, they had full doubt, they mocked Musa alayhi salam. They mocked the food that came down to Musa alayhi salam. Isa alayhi salam, this group of disciples, they're grateful. They fully understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who sends food. They do sajda to shukur. They prostrate out of gratitude at the end. So this is a completely different quality of people. So Allah is praising this quality of people in the disciples of Isa alayhi salam, the disciples of Christ. As for those that went astray after Christ after Jesus, peace be upon him. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the end, the last four ayat or five ayat of the surah where Isa alayhi salam is being raised on the day of judgment and he's being asked, did you tell the people to take you as a God besides Allah? You or your mother as a God beside Allah. Um, and Isa alayhi salam says, Subhanak, ma yakunu li an aqula ma laysa li bihaq. Uh, how perfect are you? I, could, I would never say that which I don't have the right to say. If I would have said that, فَقَدْ عَلِمْتَ Because you would have known that, O oh Allah. تَعْلَمُ مَا فِي نَفْسِي You know what's inside of me. I don't know what's inside of you. You are alamul الْغِيُوبِ You're the knower of the unseen. So Isa alayhi salam, uh, first of all, distancing himself from the claim that he is a god, uh, or that he, is, that, you know, that, that he is a partner with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then Isa alayhi salam uh, saying that, you know, look, I was a witness upon them. مَا دُمْتُ فِيهِمْ As long as I was amongst them. فَلَمَّا تَوَفَّيْتَنِي But once you took me back, O oh Allah, you were the one who was raqib. You were the one who was, who was observing them and, and, and watching over them and so on and so forth. إِن تُعَذِّبْهُمْ If you punish them, they are your servants. And if you forgive them, then you are the all-wise and the all-knowing. Uh, or, or, you know, uh, this, is, this is Isa alayhi salam, Jesus peace be upon him, saying that, O oh Allah, you know, I did not teach them that. You know that, O oh Allah. And of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that. But it's part of the bearing witness on the Day of Judgment. And in, on the Day of Judgment, the victim is asked as opposed to the one who's, who's, uh, who's the oppressor. And in this situation, Isa Islam is the victim of having a claim associated to him that he never made, alayhi salam. So that's the end of Surah Al-Ma'idah. It is one of the very last surahs of the Qur'an. Uh, it coincides with the farewell of the Prophet Sallallahu So in fact, some of the last ayat of Al-Ma'idah also are of the last ayat that were revealed to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then we move into Surah Al-An'am. Surah Al-An'am is again the first Makki Surah in the order of the Qur'an. The beauty of it, the glory of it, it was revealed all in one shot. It came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam accompanied by 70,000 angels. All of them praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, glorifying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The scholars say that Al-An'am is the surah that mentions Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala almost more frequently than almost any surah in the Qur'an. So because of all of the glory of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this surah, it came down to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Jibreel alayhi salam, surrounded by 70,000 angels glorifying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and this entire surah came to him at once. And subhanAllah, it's such a powerful surah. It's a very long surah that when the Prophet recited it to Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, 
for the first time, Ibn Mas'ud memorized it right away. Meaning Ibn Mas'ud عنه, was so struck, just as it came to the heart of the Prophet it went from the heart of the Prophet to the heart of Ibn Mas'ud, he memorized it in the first shot. So it's a long, powerful, glorious surah of the Qur'an, subhanAllah. And it's the first dose we get of Makki Qur'an. So naturally there's a shift of tone. It goes to what we're more accustomed to and Juz'a Amma and so on and so forth. In the last juz, but in a very long uh, discourse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spelling out uh, His oneness and the belief in the hereafter and so on and so forth. So it's it's the longest of the Makki surahs and it's the first Makki surah uh, that appears in the Qur'an. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, just like we're accustomed to a Makki Qur'an, immediately Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala focuses on His oneness. It starts off, Alhamdulillah alladhi khalaq as-samawati wal-ard wa ja'ala al-dhulumati wal-nur. ثُمَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا بِرَبِّهِمْ يَعْدِلُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that all praises be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who, uh, who created the heavens and the earth and who made, um, who, who, made, uh, who, who made the darkness and the light. And he says that verily uh, those who disbelieve equate others with their Lord. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala immediately starts to stress His oneness and He starts to stress His creation. هُوَ الَّذِي خَلَقَكُمْ مِنْ طِينٍ he was the one who created you from dirt, from dirt. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala qada ajala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, specified a term and a specified time that's known to him. Um, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, ثُمَّ أَنْتُمْ تَمْتَرُونَ Yet still you are in dispute. So it starts off with that tone that we're accustomed to in Mecca Qur'an, Allah stressing his oneness and, um, and clarifying that uh, he is the one who creates, he is the only one worthy of worship and unconditional obedience, and he is fully unique subhanahu wa ta'ala in his names and attributes. So this is Makki Qur'an, and we also see in verse 6, as opposed to focusing on the people of Musa, or the people of Isa, or anything of that sort, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَلَمْ يَرَوْ كَمْ أَهْلَكْنَا مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ مِنْ قَرْنٍ مَكَّنَّاهُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ مَا لَمْ نُمَكِّنْ لَهُمْ so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Malam numakin lakum. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Have they not seen how many generations were destroyed before them? The people of Ad and Thamud and so on and so forth. This is the people of Mecca, as well as Bani Israel and those nations that were established in the earth in a way that you were not established. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the different things that were sent upon them to destroy them. So this is more than likely referring to the nations that the people of Mecca were able to observe. The destroyed um the destroyed nations that were observable to them, particularly in the area of Yemen and, and where modern day Saudi Arabia is. So in Jazirat al Arab, the people of Ad and Thamud and some of the original Arabs, the ruins of those nations. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala draws attention to them, as well as the nations that are mentioned to us, obviously in Surah Al Baqarah and Surah Ali Imran and An Nisa and Al Ma'idah, um, of those that were destroyed before for turning back on the covenant with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions them, verse 7 to 10, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, no matter what he would have sent, or how he would have sent the message, or what miracle was given to the Prophet sallallahu they still would have rejected him. Why is that so important? Because you saw it with the people of Isa, you saw it with the people of Musa, you saw it with the prophets of Bani Israel, no matter what was sent to them, they still rejected because they had the diseases of desire and or pride. So one of those two things, or both of those things, obstructed them from the truth, and there was nothing that could have been different about the message that would have changed that in any way whatsoever. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that these people, the people of Mecca for example, they're saying that had Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent an angel, why didn't Allah send an angel instead of a man in the Prophet sallallahu Why didn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send an angel with the Qur'an? And then we all would have believed. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, even if an angel was to come, and he had the book in his hand, and you were to touch those pages, you still would have said, هَذَا سِحْرٌ مُبِينٌ You still would have said, this is nothing but magic and sorcery. Because you have a disease in your heart. And if you have a disease in your heart, you're blocked from the truth. أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ أَمْ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبٍ أَقْفَالُهَا Are they unable to comprehend the Qur'an, or do they have locks on their hearts? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, it doesn't matter what miracle is given to you, Ya Rasulullah, whether it's the Qur'an or splitting the moon, or whatever it may be, a person who does not want to accept the truth will not accept the truth. We see this with Bani Israel, the things that were given to them of miracles, all they responded with was, هَذَا سِحْرٌ mubin, Disrespect to their prophets, and saying that this is nothing but sorcery and magic. They dismissed it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the Prophet in this discourse, 
that the other prophets, ustuhzia, they were they were mocked as well. Istihza was done with them as well. You're not going to be any different, Ya Rasulullah. They're going to mock you and they're going to deny you, just like they denied the other prophets when they came with their miracles before. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if we go to verse 22, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَيَوْمَ نَحْشُرُهُمْ جَمِيعًا And the day that we gather them all together, all of these different people that worshipped all of these different things, that denied Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in all of these different ways. ثُمَّ نَقُولُ لِلَّذِينَ أَشْرَكُوا And we say to all of those that worship partners besides Allah, أَيْنَ شُرَكَاءُكُمُ الَّذِينَ كُنْتُمْ تَزْعَمُونَ Where are those, uh, those partners that you used to claim belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, where are they now? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions bringing them all back together, gathering them on the Day of Judgment and saying, where are those partners today, those that were worshipped besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And in verse 25, we see the first occurrence of a term that's very frequent in Makki Qur'an, that they dismiss the Qur'an as saying that this is nothing but asatirul awwaleen, the insult to the Prophet sallallahu as they said, this is nothing but the tales of the old, these are just uh, fables and fictional stories, of the people that came before, they're not real, the message is not real, Musa was not real, Isa was not real, so on and so forth. All of these messages are to be dismissed and they're nothing but fables. And they go to the point uh, of saying that وَقَالُوا إِنْ هِيَ إِلَّا حَيَاتُنَا dunya. The only life that we have is our worldly life. وَمَا نَحْنُ بِمَبْعُثِينَ And we're not going to be gathered, we're not going to be brought back to life. So subhanAllah, they're saying this after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the day that we will bring them all together and we'll say, where are those gods that you used to worship beside Allah? And here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning, it's like calling to their memory when they're standing on the day of judgment. Remember when you said that these are nothing but fables and, and old fictional tales and stories and none of this is real and so on and so forth. Remember when you used to make those claims? And of course here you can tell it's being addressed to the people of Mecca because the people of the book don't deny the hereafter. The people of Mecca were of the very few peoples that had the audacity to say that once we die, we are not brought back to life. Okay, amongst the people of the book, for the most part, there is a belief. Of course, uh, there, there, there were the Sadducees that, amongst the Jews that, that denied the, the belief in the hereafter, but for the most part, there was an acceptance and acknowledgement of the hereafter. These people completely denied um, being resurrected after death. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala very beautifully, um, in, so if you go to from verse 36 to about verse 42, and in fact there's another mention. In verse 38, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the, uh, the animals using their, you know, using their natural instincts to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in verse 59, so 38, Allah mentions the animals, and 59, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the plants that all of these follow the course of nature that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has written for them. How can you be so arrogant when even the, the, the animals in verse 38 and the plants in verse 59, even they glorify Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in their way. They run their course, the sun, the moon, the stars, so on and so forth. All of these things run their course, glorifying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in their own way. So you know, how can you be so arrogant? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, are you deceived by what's been given to you of this world, the ease and the goodness that's been given to you in this world? So forget about just the people that have been destroyed in the path and in, in the past. Think about your own life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, so this is verse 42 to 50, you sort of have the don't be deceived by this world um, uh, threat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَلَمَّا نَسُوا مَا ذُكِّرُوا بِهِ فَتَحْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ أَبْوَابَ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ uh, that whenever, when they forgot that which they'd been reminded of, when they turned away from the guidance that came to them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we opened to them the doors of every good thing. So we didn't punish them with, with, uh, with lightning strikes and with earthquakes and so on and so forth. Allah punished them by letting them dwell in their ease. You know what? You want this dunya? Take this dunya. Take the world. And that's why the, the, the Sahaba used to fear that when things were too easy in life, they feared that it was istidraj, that it was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reeling them in, that it was a sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's abandoning them, right? That go ahead and, and enjoy every aspect of life that you want to. This is what you want. You're turning away from guidance. You're not heeding the remembrance. فَتَحْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ أَبْوَابَ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ That we open for them all of the doors of good. حَتَّى إِذَا فَرِحُوا بِمَا أُوتُوا until they were pleased with everything that was given to them, فَإِذَا هُمْ We snatched them suddenly and they were left in despair. 
So even if you felt a sense of joy and invincibility at one point, here you are now, either you found despair because you realized that when the doors of the dunya opened to you, it wasn't all that it was made out to be. So it wasn't worth rejecting purpose and divine guidance for the sake of it. Or death came to you before you could even really enjoy those things in the first place. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took you and you were completely left in despair. And subhanAllah, what a beautiful transition point we have here. To introduce Makki Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala focuses on the Prophet that really ties Madani Qur'an to Makki Qur'an, that ties the people of the book to the people of Mecca, that ties all of these people together, and that's Ibrahim alayhi salam. So Surat al-An'am focuses on Ibrahim alayhi salam and Ibrahim alayhi salam's journey and his natural acknowledgement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If the animals recognize it and the plants recognize it, Allah is saying, use your fitrah. Use your natural instincts to come to the conclusion of God. So in verse 74 to 79, we see Ibrahim Islam, who's honored by the people of the book, who we've just been reading about for over 150 pages. And we see the people of Mecca now, who also love Ibrahim and acknowledge Ibrahim salam in a way because of the Kaaba. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you know, giving to us Ibrahim salam, Ibrahim arguing with his people. When the sun, with with the stars and the moon and the sun, basically every time he saw the stars, al kawakib, or when he saw uh, al qamar, or when he saw a shams, when he saw the stars, the moon and the sun, he told his people, he said, "This must be our Lord. Look how bright and beautiful it is." But then once the stars went away, once the moon set, once the sun sets, Ibrahim alaihissalam, each time. He said that this can't be Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not disappear. These are clearly things that are running their course as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created them to run their course. So I don't believe in these things being uh, God. So Ibrahim alayhi was arguing with the natural instincts, you know, that look, how is it possible that these things are God? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the, 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 the hujjah of Ibrahim against his people, the proofs that he employed against his people. And the way that he argued against his people, common sense, using nature's course to say, how could there but be anything but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creating this and managing this entire sophisticated universe? The sun, the moon, the stars, the plants, the animals, everyone runs their course in accordance with the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created them. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, This is 80 to 82 now with Ibrahim islam that this was our argument. We gave it to Abraham to use against his people. Meaning Ibrahim Islam was divinely inspired with the argument that he used. And he says, That we raise who we want. We raise who we will uh, by degrees. Meaning we raised Ibrahim Islam above his people. And he says, Verily your Lord is all wise and all knowing. So he inspired Ibrahim Islam with wisdom and with knowledge, and he protected Ibrahim and he elevated Ibrahim alayhi uh, salam from his people um, when they uh, when they rejected him. So Allah uses Ibrahim as the transition point between Madani and Makki Quran because he is the the father of the Abrahamic faiths. He is the one who is acknowledged by more people than anyone else. Subhanallah. He is the unifying factor, Ibrahim alayhi salam, uh, that we have. Then after that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ibrahim, not only was Ibrahim alayhi salam not a mushrik, not only did he not associate a partner with God, and subhanAllah, no, across the board, no one could ever make the claim that Abraham associated a partner with God. Ibrahim represents monotheism. He is the, the embodiment of monotheism. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then mentions in a beautiful discourse from verse 83 to 87, he mentions almost 20 prophets he says, tell me which of these prophets was upon shirk. Ibrahim, Ishaq, Yaqub, Nuh, Zakaria, Yahya, Isa, so on and so forth. Allah starts to rattle off the names of all these prophets and says, who amongst them was on anything but this? Who? And you say to the Prophet awwalin these are the fables of old. He is in the long line of divinely inspired prophets that have called people to oneness. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, none of these people were pagans. None of these associated partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, once again, He calls to the attention of uh, of the listener some of the things of creation and the bayinat, the, the proofs that have come. And how could Allah have a partner? How could Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have anyone share with Him in His dominion? Subhana, He is perfect. 
La to in, in verse 103, it's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful verse. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, La to al absar that the eyes perceive him not. Vision perceives him not. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala perceives all vision. So vision perceives him not, but his vision perceives all. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ever subtle, yet ever acquainted. SubhanAllah. So just because you're not seeing him the way you're seeing the idols or these images that you've drawn or these paintings or whatever it is, realize that your vision does not encompass him, but his vision and his vision encompasses all vision. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ever subtle, yet ever acquainted. Finally, you know, the way that this juz ends actually, uh, verse 108 to 110, uh, a very important lesson in interfaith for us actually, and in talking and doing da'wah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, you know, don't insult, wala tasubbu, don't insult alladhina yad'una min dunillah, those who invoke other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't be insulting when you call them to this common sense and you call them to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Fayasubullah, they will turn back and curse Allah and they'll curse your religion. If you insult their religion and belittle them and belittle their religion, they're just going to turn around and belittle your God and belittle your religion. And it's not going to be a productive conversation. Instead, call people with wisdom and with common sense and with reasoning and with beautiful preaching. Hopefully then they'll come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it, it's very important for us, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us as we're making these arguments with the people to employ civility. As Ibrahim islam was very civil with his people. Yes, he called them to the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but he used beautiful preaching and methods as opposed to insults and so on and so forth. So don't be insulting towards the people or else they'll simply turn around and they will insult your God and insult your religion. So that's uh, Juz 7, Alhamdulillah, Surah Al-An'am is a glorious, glorious, glorious Surah. If it came down with 70,000 angels in one shot to the Prophet Imagine the reward when you start to read Surah Al-An'am. So think about it, how many Malaika come to